こんにちは、みなさん。あ、uh,、ガンダハポポサイニョラハット。Uh, I'm very pleased to be here today for the second webinar of JICA.、Uh, the Japan Foundation,、uh, as you know, is the only institution、uh, dedicated to carrying out Japanese,、uh, Japan's comprehensive international culture exchange programs、uh, throughout the world. In line with this, we acknowledge the existence of various forms of contemporary art exchanges between Japanese and Filipino in the、uh, Filipino contemporary arts artists. What we aim to achieve through this JCAP is to link together what, what were once isolated individual connections and weave them into a more expansive and all inclusive exchange. This new project aims to foster dialogue, interaction, idea exchange, and collaboration between artists and curators from Japan and the Philippines. For JCAP's second webinar, we are pleased to invite Ms. Mayumi Hirano, who will share her experiences and the result of her research in Japan through the Ishibashi Foundation. The Japan Foundation Fellowship for Research on Japanese Art. To supplement Hirano san's presentation, Ms. Skizek's l a b a s t r i a of JFM will talk briefly about some grant programs where you can get opportunities to get connection with Japan. We would like to thank all of our artists, curators who helped us realize this new platform. I would also like to express my sincerest gratitude to all of our audiences. Thank you for your presence and participation. Enjoy the webinar. Arigato gozaimasu, Abe san, for welcoming our audience. Now, before we begin, I am honored to introduce Ms. Mayumi Hirano, our guest speaker for today, who JFM has been working with for a number of projects. Mayumi Hirano was born in Japan and currently lives and works in Quezon City. She is a co founder and co facilitator of the art initiative Load the Dito Project since 2016. Her curatorial practice revolves around the problem of invisible work, entailed in art projects. It speculates and challenges the structures that fashion the dominant discourse of art and the power hierarchy within it. Her research,、uh, her research focuses on the functions and potentials of art exhibitions and festivals as temporal spaces of intercultural knowledge, production, and circulation, and as platforms to nurture mutual responsibility, proposing curatorial methodologies grounded in context. Subjects of her ongoing research include shifts in curatorial methods in the early years of the Visayas Islands, Visual Arts Exhibition and Conference, or the Viva Excon. And cultural solidarity movements through the Japan Negros campaign. Her professional work includes project manager of Guangzhou Biennale in 2018, curator of Koganecho Bazaar in Yokohama 2008 to 2013, adjunct researcher for Asia Art Archive in Hong Kong, and curatorial assistant of the Yokohama Triennale in 2005. She is a recipient of Ishibashi Foundation and the Japan Foundation Fellowship for research on Japanese art. And Nippon Foundation's Asian Public Intellectual Fellowship. She completed her master's studies at the Center for Cultural Studies, Bard College. Mayumi san's recent publications and research projects include Seizo Tashima and the Philippines in the 1980s, supported by the Ishibashi Foundation and the Japan Foundation Fellowship. Please use Other Door, Another Look at Exhibition Making, published with Luda Dito, and Almost Curating Tensions and Hangings. Essay co authored with Mark Salvatus, published in Writing Presently, PECAN 2020. Mayumi san is preparing an upcoming exhibition in the era of post LCC this November in Quezon City, co curated with Penwadi no Paquet、uh, Manot, TRA Travel, and Load Nadito with the kind support of Japan Foundation Manila. She is currently a, a senior lecturer at the Department of Art Studies, University of the Philippines, Diliman. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience. Let us all welcome Ms. Mayumi Hirano. Thank you very much, Shuza, for the kind introduction. And I would like to also express my gratitude for this invitation to Jeff Manila to share my ongoing research. And before I share my ongoing research, I would like to、um, tell some stories as a way to introduce myself. So、um, let me share my slides.
Before moving to the Philippines, I worked as a curator for an artist residency program in Koganecho, Yokohama. The residency program repurposed small premises formerly used for illegal sex trade by converting it into a studio slash living space for artists. They had been abandoned since the police forcefully removed the underground business from the area. Koganecho was one of the Japan's largest red light districts, forcing pouring women into sex trafficking. Most of the women working in Koganecho came from Russia, Colombia, and Southeast Asia, including the Philippines. My work in Koganecho began by cleaning the abandoned brothels. When I started my work in Koganecho, three, uh, three years had passed since the crackdown, but the smell, temperature, humidity, and texture in the tiny rooms were vivid and stuck to my body and mind. Cleaning the abandoned shells, I couldn't stop imagining the former occupants of the room or the women whom I had never met. This physical and psychological experience still stays with me until today. This was my first real encounter with Southeast Asia and the Philippines. Today, I live in Quezon City and I occasionally and unexpectedly encounter Japan. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, I was riding a jeepney. Are you Japanese? A young man seated in front of me asked in Japanese. While being stuck in traffic, he started to tell me his story. His mother is Filipina and his father is Japanese, whom he has never met in his life. His mother disappeared when he was 13. He recently lost his grandfather, who was the only family to him. This meant the loss of home, a place where he could go back. He muttered quite quietly. He didn't have anywhere to go. He would spend the night on the jeepney. Last month, I was at the heritage villa, Nira Nira, which is very close to where I live now. The house was built in 1929 by the Benitez family during the American period. A family member of the house shared the story of Japanese gardeners working for the family before the World War II. The story goes, in 1941, the family gardener revealed himself as a lieutenant and informed the owner that army officers would soon take over the house, advising all family members and staff to move out. Unwilling to move out at first, the owner of the house decided to leave. Uh, however, the owner of the house decided to leave the compound when she saw the Japanese army removing their shoes before entering her house. The Japanese military occupied the compound until 1945. Several years ago, when I was part of an art collective in Escota, the owner of the first United Building in Binondo told me a story about his family. His uncle was captured in 1945 by the Japanese and never returned. His father lost his eight children and his first wife to a fire during the Battle of Manila. During my first research trip in the Philippines, a Filipino friend of mine reminded me that the term collaborator was used to designate Filipino people who sided with Japan in wartime. Some of the artworks in Vargas Museum's collection make me think of the slippery notion of Japan, Philippines collaboration, sugar coated by the word like friendship or friends. These stories are lived by the people in front of me. As the stories are told to me, they suddenly become part of my reality. They are constant reminders of what Japan and Japanese people have done in their relations with the Philippines. They always make me think about the responsibilities I should take as an individual. Research is a way for me to continue thinking about these questions. Therefore, I continue my research slowly at a breathtaking pace that matches the speed of my daily life. It is a process of following a thread of relations by unraveling entanglements. My research focuses on art projects, such as exhibitions and festivals, which are made by the hands of multiple people, 
I am interested in how they create contact points between host and guest, inside and outside, and past and present. What are the intentions, effects, and potentials of temporarily opening the gate to one's territory or community? Can an unexpected temporal encounter forge fair exchanges between the host and guest and nurture responsibility for each other? How do these exchanges affect or engender new artistic forms and practices? From 2013 to 2014, I had the chance to visit and interview artist groups living and working in different parts of the Philippines. Among them, the visit with Talandic artists in their ancestral land in Lamtapang, Bukit Nong, was insightful in thinking about the function of boundaries and the host and guest relationship. On the occasion of an outsider's visit, the Talandic community conducts the bloodletting Padugo ritual. Several chickens are sacrificed as offering to Magbabaya, the creator of all things, and to the spirits guarding the river, the soil, the trees, animals, and everything in the world. The ritual is a prayer to ward off evil spirits, to ask the creator's permission to receive the guest under their guidance, and bless the birth of a new relationship. My visit was during the Talandic Day celebration, which started with rituals, followed by leaders' addresses, presentations of colorful traditional dances, drums, songs, soil painting workshops, and offering of food. A festival is an occasion to affirm their culture and identity as a people and forge a sense of solidarity. In contrast to the welcoming and lively atmosphere of the festival, the reality of Talandic's existence remains insecure as they continue struggling for official recognition of their traditional tribal homeland. Without the legal protection of their land title, Talandic people are experiencing the aggression of large agricultural corporations. Their ecosystem is exploited by political and financial reasons of the external forces which constantly attempt to conquer the tribal territory by dividing the community. The integrity of the cultural identity is essential in enabling collective decision-making, what offer to accept, what projects to participate. My experience of being warmly welcomed as a guest during the Talandi Cultural Day made me think about my responsibility for the host community during and my during and beyond my visit. Today, contemporary art festivals are being held in various locations, welcoming participants and visitors from outside. While these community-based festivals often emphasize the cultural value of exchange and collaboration, I feel that the actuality of the practice is often left untouched. Tensions arise when the outside and the inside meet. How do these tensions affect the artistic practice and form of expression and even the notion of art? Visayas Island's visual art exhibition and conference provides an opportunity for me to examine these questions. My investigation focuses especially on its beginning stages, beginning stages in the 1990s. Visayas Island's Visual Art Exhibition and Conference, which is commonly known as Viva Excom, is a Biennale Festival of Visual Arts held in the Visayas region. Different artist groups across the region take responsibility for hosting the festival. Thus, the festival has been traveling across the Visayas and nurturing a thriving community of artists and cultural workers in the Visayas region since its beginning in 1990. Researchers and curators have pointed out that the notion of camaraderie is crucial in understanding the nature of the Viva Excom. Viva Excom was initiated by a group of artists and cultural workers called Black Artists in Asia from Bacolod, Negros Island. The Black Artists in Asia was formed in August 1986, six months after the People's Power Revolution. Some members of the Black Artists in Asia shared their prior commitment to cultural activism 
to oppose both the Malcos dictatorship and the semi-feudal system of sugar industry in Negros Island. Thus, since its inception, the collective had a cohesive working relation devoid of the divisiveness that usually characterizes and paralyzes many organizations, uh, as observed by cultural historian, Dr. Maria Cecilia Roxinava. As written in the newsletter of Black Artists in Asia, the group emphasized the need for creating linkages of progressive art groups within the Visayas region, the Philippines, and the Asia Pacific regions to advance Filipino people's art and assert dignity in carrying out the people's cultural work. For Black artists in Asia, workshops and exhibitions were the tool to facilitate collective engagement, nurture a sense of solidarity. They conceived the Viva Excom in 1990 in their home city of Bacolod. The festival was envisioned to function as a coordinating body for different artist groups to form and strengthen the cultural networks across the Visayan region, assert the presence of the Visayan contemporary art on the national and international platform, and lobby for support and assistance from national or international communities. Consisting of two core programs, exhibition and conference, the first edition successfully convened eight, 48 participants from various locations in the Visayas region, as well as Manila and Baguio. The second edition held again in Bacolod extended its invitation outside of the Philippines, which reached to Japan. In the pre-internet age, information had to be physically circulated via printed materials or word of mouth. So how did the invitation of Viva Exco 1992 reach to the artists in Japan? It was through a gallery in Tokyo called Lunami Gallery, which opened in 1963 and closed in 1998. The owner of the Lunami Gallery, Miss Emiko Namikawa, recalled that she heard about Viva Exco from Mr. Ben Suzuki, the current director of Japan Foundation Manila office. Indeed, Mr. Suzuki had met some members of Black artists in Asia in Bacolod in the late 80s during his personal research trip to Negros. He recalls his research trip was prompted by the encounter with a terrifying illustration printed in the newsletter of Black artists in Asia in the Mekon bookstore in Kanda, Tokyo. Mr. Tatsuo Inagaki is one of the artists who accepted the open invitation to Viva Excom 1992 through Lunami Gallery. He recalls, in the early 90s, the contemporary art world in Japan was centered in Tokyo and very exclusively operated by a small number of curators, commercial galleries, scholars, and art critics. There was also overshadowing atmosphere of loss of a community as a result of rapid economic growth which had prompted individualism in Japanese society. The artists who did not fit to the mainstream art world in Japan had two venues to show their works, rental galleries, where the artists pay the fee to use the space, or outdoor art festivals held in depopulated villages across the country, often led by artists in cooperation with the local government. These two types of platforms developed active networks of artists, organizers, and audience, which often intersected with each other. The feeling of being a misfit to the mainstream discourse compelled them to search for a community or an alternative art ecosystem to belong to, inspire, and continue their practices. Around the same time, similar kinds of outdoor art festivals were also initiated by artists in regional cities in South Korea, Germany, and other countries, which formed and activated cross-border movements and grassroots exchanges among artists. The Japanese artists considered Viva Excom as part of the larger network of artist-run outdoor festivals. They didn't have much knowledge about the Viva Excom and its larger cultural and social context of Negros or the Philippines. 
just as a backgrounder. News about contemporary art from the Philippines was not widely circulated in Japan back then. Fukuoka Art Museum had actively introduced contemporary art from Southeast Asia since 1980. However, exhibitions and efforts in Fukuoka Art Museum were hardly mentioned in mainstream art magazines or major newspapers until 1994, when the Asahi newspaper published an article with a heading, Boom of Asian Contemporary Art. In response to this newspaper article, Raiji Kuroda, curator of Fukuoka City Art Museum at the time, wrote with irony, and I quote, we at the Fukuoka City Museum of Art are honestly enjoying the joy of finally making our national debut after 15 years of being disconnected by the media coverage. But at the same time, those of us who have been introducing Asian modern and contemporary art to Japan since the museum opened in 1979 could not help but feel a renewed sense of Tokyo-centeredness while encountering the world the word boom in the article in a major newspaper, end of quote. Artists who responded to the Viva XCOM invitation included Tatsuo Inagaki, Akatsuki Harada, Teresa Teikobayashi, Hitomi Hiten Utami, Tsunetaka Komatsu, and Dodo Drummers, which included Rieko Shinbo, Osamu Kitahara, and Hideaki Kaneko. The artists individually arranged their flights to Bakoro via Manila. Mr. Inagaki remembers that he only bought a ticket to Manila and went to the cultural center of the Philippines to ask for their assistance to find his way out to Bakoro. It was only at the airport in Bakoro the Japanese artists met the organizers of Viva XCOM for the first time. There is no mention in the official programs However, one of the essential features of the Viva Expo 1992 was a homemade artist in residency that facilitated the practice of hospitality. Not only did the host artists assist the guest artists with the production and presentation of artworks, but with the basic life needs. The memories of the exhibition and conference have been fragmented and blurred but the experience of interactions between people from different cultural and social backgrounds lasts longer as a sensory and emotional memory. While the dimension of care work is often neglected and made invisible as an unofficial private matter in an exhibition, it is essential work in realizing an exhibition. If the fair relationship is created between the caregiver and receiver, it can forge effective connectivity that travels beyond the space of an exhibition. The exchange of hospitality motivates us to act with others in mind and collectively nurture a sense of home. After the Japanese artists participated in Viva Home in 1992, some Japanese artists sent an invitation to the Filipino artists they met at the Viva Expo 1992 to the Lake Naguri Open Air Art Exhibition in Saitama, Japan in 1994. Several artists from Bakoro and Baguio accepted the invitation and participated in the festival, uh, through which the Japanese artists committed themselves to return the hospitality to the Filipino artists. <laughs> The art festivals function as a venue to develop responsibility for fellow human beings. So going back to Viva Expo 1992, looking closely at the photo documentation of the Viva Expo 1992, I find clean tensions between individual artistic drive and consideration of others. The documentation allow me to imagine the dynamic energy created through a series of events, conflicts, negotiations, agreements and disagreements among the artists working in the same space simultaneously. In recalling the Viva Expo 1992, jamming was the term used by several artists. Diverse expressions and ideas of art sometimes made harmony, other times discordance. 
the snapshots and personal stories suggest that the collective engagements were not necessarily smooth, harmonious, harmless, and successful in achieving the sense of horizontal participation and ownership of the space. The process of making the exhibition may not have been so reciprocal and open as a researcher like me wishes to imagine. As written by Raul de Agner, and I quote him, non Visayan guest artists came from Baguio and even as far as Japan, but then again, the guests tended to overshadow the locals, end of quote. The third Viva Excom was held in 1994, and it was for the first time the festival moved away from the city of Bakolod. The hosting responsibility was passed to the artists in Dumaguete from the Black Artists in Asia. This time, the exhibition and conference aimed to assess the experiences of the first two Viva Excoms by the artists locally based in the Visayas. Dr. Nava writes, and I quote, Though the third Viva Excon in Dumaguete was at the start the most poorly coordinated of the three Vivas, it was in the opinion of some artists the most meaningful and the most crucial because it decided among them whether Viva Excon should be continued. Ironically, despite its poor organization and limited finances, it succeeded in consolidating the artists. End of quote. The artists of Visayas collectively determined the Viva Excom be solely for the Visayan artists. The time was right around the beginning of the Biennale boom in the Asian region, such as the inauguration of Asia Pacific Trenare in 1993, Guangzhou Biennale in 1995, and Shanghai Biennale in 1996. The collective decision of the Visayan artists to make the Viva Excom exclusively regional by only showcasing the works of artists from the Visayas may seem going against the main current, striving for internationalism. However, I believe it is because of this exclusiveness. Viva Excom eventually developed a shared sense of belonging, ownership, and responsibility to continue the Biennale event. This makes the Viva Excom an original kind of contemporary art festival which cannot be replicated in anywhere else. It created an art ecosystem truthful to the reality of artists living in the locality. I also want to briefly discuss how the Viva Expo 1992 influenced the subsequent artistic practices of the participating Japanese artists, including Mr. Akatsuki Harada and Mr. Inagaki. Mr. Akatsuki Harada remembers, and I quote him, in Viva Excom 1992 in Bakorod, I got inspiration from the place, the people, and the environment. Since then, working inside a traditional sculptor studio became meaningless for me, end of quote. Since Viva Excom 1992, he has been creating works by borrowing materials from the environment which led him to initiate an outdoor art festival in the woods in his hometown of Samukawa in Kanagawa in 1994. The festival is organized by a group of artists until today, and it has been providing an open platform for artists with different backgrounds to immerse oneself in the natural environment and through interaction with the materials available on site and working with uncontrollability of the weather. Since he participated in Viva Excom 1992, Mr. Tatsuo Inagaki takes a fieldwork approach to open the site for person-to-person -person communication. His artistic process involves local residents during all stages from the research, production, to the final presentation. Mimicking a conventional museum display, the final presentation is set up in a public space which is easily accessible by the local residents. His practice shifts the notion of artist from being an author to a facilitator of communication, 
encouraging people to express and listen to each other. After almost 20 years, Mr. Inagaki reconnected with the organizers of Viva Excom in Iroiro in 2015. And since then, he sustains his connection with artists in the Visayas, not only by social media, but by making actual visits and facilitating workshops in and outside of the Viva Excom. So the research I conducted with the general support of the Ishibashi Foundation, Japan Foundation this year, also branched out from my Viva Expo 1992 research. It all began when I noticed a same illustration in the snapshot of a member of Black Artists in Asia and their newsletter. It's an illustration of a man hugging his bony legs staring straight at the viewer. And I imagine this painting might actually have been the terrifying image that Mr. Ben Suzuki saw in the bookshop in Tokyo in late 1980s. The Black Artists in Asia newsletter credits the work to Seizo Tashima. The name sounded very familiar to me and it took me a few seconds to realize it was the name of a Japanese picture book artist, some of whose works I grew up with. By coincidence, Mr. Nobel P.W. Roldan, who designed the BAA newsletter, Black Artists in Asia newsletter, was also trying to get in touch with Mr. Seizo Tashima. Mr. Tashima delightedly accepted our request to interview him for the Miso Laswa project of Green Papaya Art Projects last year. The primary purpose of my recent research in Japan aimed to study Mr. Tashima's work about Negros in late 1980s and study a larger context around it. Mr. Tashima's encounter with Negros was quite distinct from the artists who participated in the Viva Excom 1992 from Japan. So who is Seizo Tashima? Uh, Mr. Seizo Tashima was born in 1940 in Osaka. The experience of living in the abundant nature of Kochi during his boyhood is still the source of creation for him. Mr. Tashima graduated from the design department at Tama Art University in 1962. His twin brother, Mr. Yukihiko Tajima, is also a picture book author and an artist who is specialized in dyeing technique. Mr. Tashima has been at the forefront of the picture book industry since the 1960s and has published over 100 children's picture books. He is a recipient of, a national, of national and international hours and a prolific writer who has published numerous essays. His work continues to break through all the preconceptions of picture books as an educational device for adults to teach children. His stories are diverse, some funny, and fun, others serious and heavy, and his techniques and styles of expression change for each book he produces. This manifests his skepticism about acclaim, popularity, establishment, and tradition. Although his works are distinct from each other, the philosophy behind Mr. Tashima's work is always consistent, fueled by his anger against war, destruction of the environment, discrimination, and abuse of power. I would also like to mention that Mr. Tashima has always been an activist artist. Around 1970, he was at the center of the picture book artists who opposed the Vietnam War. In the 1980s, even before the art group movement came to Japan, he had seen its value and began exchanges with the members of Shigaraki Seinenryo Home for People with Learning Disabilities and continues supporting their works. In the, 1990s, in the 1990s, he became deeply involved in the opposition movement against the construction of a waste dump site in Western Tokyo, where he had lived since the 70s. He was also the central figure in initiating the joint publishing project of picture books for peace 
among China, Japan, and Korea in the early 2000s. While being a committed human rights advocate, Tashima has always been wary of picture books leaning toward propaganda. I quote him, picture books should be above propaganda. There should be art that is made for the sake of children, end of quote. Mr. Tashima's painting that I saw in the snapshot and the BAA newsletter was created for the poster of Japan Committee for Negros campaign. So now who is the Japan Committee for Negros campaign? The Japan Committee for Negros campaign, I will call it Negros campaign in this presentation, was an NGO established in February, 1986 to provide hunger relief in Negros Occidental, once known as the Sugar Island of the Philippines, where 60% of the sugar for the country was produced. 70% of the population of Negros Island was involved in the sugar industry in some form or another, and half of whom were landless plantation workers. The government started to control domestic and international sugar trading in the late 1970s, and this forced many sugar planters into financial problems. In addition, the international price of sugar started to drop down and reached its lowest point in the mid 1980s as sugar could no longer be sold, the landowners halted sugarcane production. As a result, the 190,000 landless sugar workers lost their jobs and were left with almost no access to food. Children and old people died of malnutrition. Famine in Negros was not caused by natural calamity, but it was man-made. To address the emergency situation in Negros, the Japan Committee for Negros campaign was founded in February 25, 1986, to raise funds for those who are suffering. The funding day coincided with the height of People Power Revolution, which commanded attention of Japanese citizens to the Philippines. It was just the right timing for Negros campaign to initiate their campaign. To disseminate the information widely, they worked with visual artists, singers, and scholars who had wider reach. Okay. So here, um, I want to show a video produced by Negros campaign. This video was produced to inform Japanese citizens about the starvation situation in Negros Occidental and the problems of sugar cane plantations and the large land ownership system behind it. The video was produced through their field work in January and February in 1986. Okay, so um, in the video is 44 minutes and it's quite long, so I'm already up on YouTube, so if you're interested in it, please um, take a look at it. But I would like to read the texts in the intro part that you saw on the green screen. So I would like to read it both in Japanese and English. Sato wa amai. Sugar is sweet. Sore de mokeru mono ni totte wa sara ni amai. Even sweeter for those who profit from it. Shikashi, sore o tsukura sareru mono ni totte wa amari ni mo nigai. But for those who are forced to produce it, it's too bitter. 1985年1985、緑豊かな島ネグロスで1000人を超える子供たちが増えて死んだ。On the last island of Negros, more than 1000 children starved and died. Okay. So this video starts with a scene of demonstration in Manila 
on February 2nd, 1986, five days before the SNAP presidential and vice presidential election. And then the video gives an introduction to the political climate of the Philippines at the time, and then goes into the life situation of the sugarcane farmers on the Negros Island. Okay. And at that time, the video was available for sale and rental for rental as part of the campaign. The video was directed by Takeshi Mori, narrated by an actor, Tsuyoshi Naito, music by Filipino folk singer, Paul Garan, Garan and opening title, um, the image that I'm showing here is designed by Seizo Tashima. And there are other artists, many other artists who, um, who participated in this campaign. And I would like to here mention some of the names of the Filipino artists. So theater artist, educator, and advocate, Miss Dessa Quesada Palm, particularly played a significant role in promoting awareness of issues of Negros in Japan. Her mini concerts were organized by the Joint Force of Negros Campaign, pertinent organizations, and the volunteer across the country. The collaborative efforts of organizing her concerts not only realized national tours of Miss Quesada Palm, but it also formed a strong cooperative network of volunteers who established satellite offices of the Negros campaign across Japan. Mr. Nune Lucio Alvarado is an artist based in Sagai City, Negros Island, who has been standing with the Sakadas, the contractual sugarcane workers suffering oppression and economic and social injustice since the 1960s. He contributed an illustration for Mascovado Sugar which was originally sold as a campaign merchandise. Since 1987, Mascovado Sugar is sold through a cooperative union of farmers, fair trade companies, and consumers in Japan. Although the artist's name is not printed on the package, this illustration could be one of the most widely circulated images by a Filipino artist within Japan. Miss Brenda Fajardo, Mr. Manuel Pampido, Mr. Noel Quizon, Mr. Bondazo, Mr. Angelo Dazo, Ms. Ida Bryan, Mr. Prospero Koval, and Mr. Manuel Chavez collaborated and created illustrations for picture book, Barangon picture book of banana from the island in 1991. The book was made for Japanese young readers. It included a variety of stories from the Philippines that talk about bananas including for the results, the monkey and the turtle. Mr. Tashima was requested to create an illustration for Negro's campaign poster. This image reminds me of a photograph of Joel Abon taken by Kim Komenich in 1985 at the hospital in Bakorut. Mr. Tashima's illustration may have been inspired by that photograph. Photography played a significant role in spreading the news of the hunger crisis in Negros Island to international communities. But in Japan, the Negros campaign took a different approach. They used an illustration by a picture book artist for their first campaign poster. This decision seems to reflect their intention to bring the issue of Negros close to a wide range of Japanese citizens, from children to seniors. Aside from the illustration for the poster, Mr. Tashima contributed illustrations for various promotional materials and created a number of artworks for fundraising. The image on the left is a pamphlet for, pamphlet for the Japan, Negros, Japan Committee for Negros Campaign by Seizo Tashima. And the right is showing some paintings uh, made for Negros campaign. And those works are now in the collection of Kalia City Art Museum in Aichi. The exhibition Tashima Seizo and Children of Negros travel to various locations to reach out to the broad public in Japan from 1986 to 1987. Negros campaign strategically negotiated and involved the department stores to hold exhibitions to amplify the media effect. 
Most of Mr. Tashima's works about Nebulos were painted based on the photographs provided by the Nebulos campaign office. This documentation of Tashima's exhibition for Nebulos campaign shows some of his works about Nebulos. The paintings are accentuated with bold affirmative lines, forms are reduced into geometric shapes, and yet expressionistic, evoking sorrowful emotions in the viewer. In this photograph, the person sitting on the right in the glasses, this is Mr. Kashima, and next to him is um, Ms. Desa Kesada Khan. In August 1986, Mr. Tashima joined the fifth exposure trip to Nebulos. The six-day tour was co-organized by the Nebulos campaign with the local organizations, including the National Federation of Sugar Workers and the Citizens Disaster Response Center in Nebulos. The trip toured the participants to hospitals, slums, and farmers' houses in the villages where the guests were warmly welcomed. During his trip to Nevros, he brought a sketchbook. The sketchbook was not new, and several pages in the front and back already had some sketches from 1980s. Mr. Tashima said he doesn't usually sketch and always thought he was not good at sketching because he studied in design school and didn't receive formal training in painting. Hence, his Negro sketchbook contains a rare example of his on-site sketches. After his trip to Negros, the sketchbook had been kept in his storage and it was never shown to public. Before my actual visit, I had seen some pages of the sketchbook in photographs. It looked like sketches were made in layers in pen and ink on one page. Sorry. Um, it looked like sketches were made in layers because it was showing the back side or the, next, the drawings on the next page. Seeing the actual sketchbook, the texture of the paper was so much more smooth yet fragile than what I had imagined from the photographs. The paper was actually quite thin. That's why the layers of drawings shown in the photograph was actually the sketches on the back of the page or the drawings on the next page. Bound with a metal spiral, flipping the page, I could hear the sound of paper rubbing against a spiral. Stained on the pages are the reminders of the time that has passed since the day the sketch was made. And he made roughly about 40 um, pages of sketches during his trip in Negros. Some sketches are accompanied by the artist's notes of personal names, the location, and the date. The fastness and spontaneity of the pencil lines and smudges manifest his honest response and strong urge to capture the expression of adults, children, and babies he met during his trip. His portrayal of people feel different from the people captured in photographs of the Negros coming that they have seen. They do not necessarily provoke the viewer's reading of the figure as victims, but as individuals with unique characters. There is no background sketched, but only the figures are sketched. This keeps his sketches distant from the optical possessiveness associated with the historical traveler's sketches. In the quick movements of lines, I imagine the artist was drawn in the act of sketching while exchanging the gaze with the people in front of him and shifting the eye down toward the paper. Some of the sketches are left undone. As we can see, a body is missing. Perhaps the person left from the site before the sketch was done. Or he might have felt not right to continue the sketch. There is no authoritative power of the artist over the subject. Indeed, the artist's attitude feels humble. I imagine his act of sketching secured a gentle, respectful space in between the subject and the artist. The artist's hand moved with the breath of the people in front of him. 
His subjects are portrayed with the stillness of life. To me, the sketches do not appear as the expression of the artist's anger or sorrow, but instead as the urge to capture the existence of others. The sketches seem to be the answer to Tashi Mr. Tashima's question to himself. How could he take responsibility for the people in front of him? So um, I would like to end my presentation with the words of Mr. Tashima. I quote, even if I am unable to stop these tragic events as a human being and an artist living in the same era, I believe my mission is to make and leave behind a work of art that will speak deeply to the people who will live in the future. How can I create works of art that touch and resonate with people's empathy rather than simply convey a political message as propaganda? I see achieving such expression is my mission." End of quote. Yeah. Um, so that's my presentation. And I just came back from my research trip to Japan. And during the research trip, I focused on searching for materials and gathering them, scanning and copying them. So um, I just now started to unpack the materials I gathered after I returned to Quezon City. So through my research, um, yeah, so this, I'm still in the process of assessing the materials and I just shared today uh, some snippets of the materials that I found. Yeah. And through my research on Mr. Tashima's sketchbook, I also found many other aspects and dimensions of the cultural solidarity efforts of artists springing from the initiative of Negros campaign. So um, from here, I plan to continue researching on this subject. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Ms. Mayumi Hirano for your honest, personal, and comprehensive presentation. Let's all give her a round of virtual applause. First of all, I'd like to congratulate you, Mayumi, for your hard work on this research. I know that you've dedicated so much time to this task of gathering, documenting, <laughs> interviewing so many people, right, and archiving all of these complicated stories about different um, important people, um, several events, right? And to be able to see these old posters, pamphlets, right? Newspapers and photographs um, is very amazing. Uh, especially the photos of casual get-togethers, behind the scenes processes, works, installations back in the 90s, and of course, the never before seen sketches of uh, Seizo Tashima. Mm -hmm and the illustrated campaign poster for the Negros campaign. So something that has captured attention, raised awareness in Japan. Perhaps later we can talk more about that, right? So it's yeah. great that we were able to see it all this afternoon. Of course, you yourself, you're a crucial figure, right? <laughs> when it comes to Japan-Philippines cultural exchange, you no? Know? Uh, uh, whether it's a curation or coordination and research, we're very grateful for all the work that you've done. We know that behind the scenes, it's been a lengthy, um, difficult, but still fulfilling process. Right? So our audience, if you have any questions, kindly send them over at the chat box function here in Zoom. You can ask your questions in Japanese, English, or even in Filipino. So before we begin with the Q&A session, Ms. Kizik Sabastilia is here to tell us about grant programs, um, including grants by the Japan Foundation. So that's all welcome, uh, Ms. Kizik Sabastilia. Thank you very much, Juja, and thank you, uh, Hirano-san, for sharing with us the highlights of the result of your research through the Ishibashi Foundation or the Japan Foundation Fellowship for Research and Japanese Art. To our viewers this afternoon, good afternoon. And to supplement Hirano-san's presentation, please allow me to share a few grant programs that are available in Japan and the Philippines. Please note, however, that the scope of my presentation is not comprehensive since it is only limited to what I'm familiar with as a cultural officer and art practitioner. My presentation is divided into three parts. First, I will mention some grant programs that are available for artists and curators in the Philippines. This will be followed by some grant programs in Japan. Lastly, I will briefly talk about the Japan Foundation grant programs 
hopefully by the end of my presentation, you will be encouraged to research these grants and hopefully some of you will consider submitting an application in the future. Let's dive into the first part of our presentation. So on top of the list is the National Commission for Culture and the Arts. I also provided here the link, so you may want to take a photo of this slide. Uh, followed by the Cultural Center of the Philippines. The UP Diliman uh, Office for Initiatives in Culture and the Arts also has a regular grant programs, as well as the Asian Cultural Council and the Metro Bank Foundation. In the Philippines, with the Republic Act 7356, or the NCCA Charter, the Commission was mandated by law to give grants to artists and cultural groups using the National Endowment Fund for Culture and the Arts, or NEFCA. Grants are annually offered for the development, protection, preservation, and dissemination of Philippine culture and the arts. So the deadline for the application for 2023 it was last August 31st. So if some of you are interested to apply in 2024, you might want to take a look at their um, official website. Next slide, please. So uh, CCP began offering this grant program, Kalina ng Sining, or Art for Healing and Transformation, in the year 2020. This uh, grant program helped hundreds of Philippine artists, especially during the first year of the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. The UP OICA grants program. So if you want to know more about uh, OICA's grant program, I, uh, the, the, their official website is www.oika.upd.edu.ph. So same with the Asian Cultural Council or the ACC. And lastly, aside uh, the, the Metro Bank Foundation. So aside from giving grants, the Metro Bank Foundation also organizes annual art competitions. So that ends the first part of my presentation. Let's now take a look at some of the grant programs that are available in Japan. Next slide, please. First on the list is the Kawamura Arts and Cultural Foundation. So they are still open to accepting applicants for the year 2023. So I also put here the links. You might want to take a screenshot of this slide. Next is the Daiwa Anglo-Japanese Foundation. Uh, also the Arts Initiative Tokyo, Japan, and as well as the Asian Cultural Council in Japan. Next slide, please. Aside from the four organizations that I've mentioned, there are several other Japanese governmental agencies, including Agency of Cultural Affairs, or Bunkacho, the Embassy of Japan, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan, of course, the Japan Foundation, and most importantly, the Japanese local government. So some prefecture cities, municipalities also offer grants, not only to Japanese citizens, but also to um, foreigners who collaborate with Japanese artists. Now let us move on to the last part of my presentation, which is the Japan Foundation Grant Programs. So with the aim to promote, introduce, and deepen understanding of Japan, as well as to strengthen cultural exchange in Asia and encourage multilateral cultural exchange between Japan and the Philippines, the Japan Foundation Grant Program provides financial support in three areas. First is the arts and culture, second, Japanese language education, and lastly, the Japanese studies and intellectual exchange. So these three areas are the three pillars of our organization. Next slide, please. So there are two sources of grants for the Japan Foundation. First is the Japan Foundation Manila Arts and Culture Grant, or JFMAC. So JFMAC is handled by uh, the Japan Foundation Manila. Second is the Japan Foundation Headquarters Grant Program. So this is a separate application process, which is processed directly by our HQ in Tokyo. Next slide, please. So these are the types of projects that we usually 
support. So you see here exhibitions, performances, seminars, conferences, workshops, or some of our grantees also asked us to uh, fund uh, some Japanese experts, scholars, performers, etc. To, to visit the Philippines. Although in the past two years since the start of the pandemic, we haven't um, approved any uh, request for, for um, travels. Hopefully in the future, we will open this again. Next slide, please. So who can apply? So applicants must be based in the Philippines and applicants must, may apply as individuals, as a group or as an institution. Who cannot apply any existing application or ongoing project supported by GFM from the same applicant in the same fiscal year. Also application received from the same applicant for three consecutive years will not be considered. Next slide, please. When to apply? After the applicant's orientation. So beginning in 2020, we conducted um, grants orientation to those who are interested to apply to our grants program. So our orientation for next year is tentatively scheduled in May 2023. And the tentative deadline of application is sometime between June to July 2023. So all proposed projects must be implemented before December 2023. And we usually notify the results within one month after our deadline. Last slide, please. So if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to send us an email or visit our website. Uh, we are looking forward to receiving your inquiries and applications. Thank you very much and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you very much, Skidix, for um, your presentation regarding the grant. So we encourage everybody to also uh, try applying for uh, the grants that were discussed uh, earlier. Now we are opening the floor for questions from our viewers. You can ask your questions in Japanese, English, or even in Filipino via Zoom's Q&A button. I also uh, kindly request uh, Mayumi-san to kindly switch on your microphone. Sure. So while we're still gathering, um, hi. Hello there, Mayumi-san. Hi, Shiza. So while we're still gathering uh, some questions uh, here in Zoom, I'd like to start with a practical question about your own research process. I'm sure that many of us are also um, very interested in this. Specifically, um, how your research came about. In your words, the process of unraveling these entanglements, especially since many of these artists and cultural workers perhaps have um, moved on to other creative or professional pursuits, or they may be very difficult to contact. And the Negros campaign in particular was a massive undertaking. There were different artists, activists, organizations, volunteers, the local community of um, sugar plantation workers, right? Their families, all of these people from Japan and the Philippines coming together. You mentioned so many people, so many places, mm -hmm. right? Of course, there's Seizo Tashima in Nagaki Tatsosa, Akatsuki Harada, right? Um, uh, the Black artists in Asia who um, also uh, started Viva Excon the Japan Coalition of Philippine Concerns, the Japan Committee for the Negros Campaign, National Federation of Sugar Workers, volunteers, artists, and so on, right? So how was the process of trying to get all of these people's perspectives and experiences who have collaborated since the 80s and the 90s? So how did you start your research? What was it like documenting um, everything? Thank you very much for the question, Shiva. It's always, um, that's why I'm excited about my research. You know, right. it's impossible for me to reach out to all these people and have interview. First, because um, the materials I'm looking at is before the internet age. So there is not much info available. So I had to first find contact point with um, an actual person. And by, you know, talking, talking, like it takes a long time. Then, you know, this discussion, the conversations leads me to another person. So it's rather, I let it um, go with the flow. And of course, with organization, I try to reach them through, you know, writing emails. And it's also some people, of course, remember many things and they want to share the stories. 
but there are times that they are not willing to share. So, you know, it's like, it's just like life, you know? And I, I, my research don't really have deadline. I'm not doing this for any commission work. So for me, this, um, you know, response, different responses like positive and negative, that's also a um, lot of information already. The response itself gives me a lot of information. Yeah, and yeah, and in terms of um, archives, it's, I was very lucky and I have to thank the, it's called APLA now, the Negros campaign has been dissolved already in 2008, but their, their activity and office is succeeded by an organization or company called APLA. And their main um, project is a fair trading. They call it people to people trading, but they have an office in Tokyo. So I emailed them and Ms. Nogawa, the director of um, department in APLA was very, very, um, she was, um, very happy actually that I'm doing this research to dig the past of Negro's campaign and especially with these promotional materials. So she told me that if I don't mind, they have a lot of boxes in the office which they have never opened really. So if I don't mind being dusty, I can go. So that's how I was able to access many of their materials. So I think it takes a lot of patience and sometimes okay. courage. Nice. Yeah, and also, yeah, sometimes it's, um, I don't know, I've been working with a research for quite a bit of time by now. So sometimes it's the people who approach me also and tell me there is materials. So it's, I think the time that we spend really is a key to continue, I mean, to get hold of people and information. Right, and it's very important that we document these memories, mm -hmm. particularly because not everything is photographed, right? Not everything has like physical mm -hmm. documentation. And so for you to be able to, yeah, again, it takes courage to approach these people. Sometimes they are strangers, right? But ultimately the goal is to be able to document memories of actual events actual people mm. it will help against perhaps the fight um, with this information today for example that we show that these actual things happen right mm. um, especially during the 80s mm. so again thank you for that but i'm also curious what compelled you to document or i archive right keep in memory these unwritten histories right mm. these invisible works and dynamics between Japanese and Visayan artists in the first place? Yes, um, thank you for that question too. So I've been working really behind the scene of exhibition making. Yes. You know, I curate my little exhibitions, but most of the time I'm working really behind the scene as coordinator or manager. Yeah. So I know there are so many um, invisible work going on and which we don't necessarily get to see as an audience in the exhibition space. But I think for, from my experience, um, this invisible forces really is what shapes the exhibition. So that through my archival research and personal interviews, I try to also explore that aspects of the exhibition making. And sometimes it's, I look at each photograph for a long time and trying to see, you know, not the center of the photograph, but what's happening around it. Like how the hand is moving, who is touching it, you know, or who is really behind sitting in the back seat. And then it, it you know, tells me more about the actual process of exhibition making. And I think when we talk about curating, you know, these things are not so often discussed but we always have to be reminded it's a teamwork and it's um it involves a lot of people in it and i'm i'm very sure that there are so many other people and efforts that i'm not yet seeing through my research right and i i really like that you have that advocacy about art managers right cultural workers who aren't necessarily credited right especially when it comes to the optics of a successful project. And 
I'm sure many of the people in the audience can resonate with your advocacy to um, to emphasize that anything, right, with Japan-Philippines cultural exchange, it involves multiple people, mm -hmm. right? Working behind the scenes to make sure that these um, collaborations actually work. And later on, we can talk about how you interrogate the uh, notions, slippery notions of collaboration and the collaborator and their evolving connotations over the years. So that's something perhaps we can also talk about later, but I'll be looking at the Q&A uh, box for now. Thanks. So I, I, I just um, want to also um, read some comments. So we have here Robert uh, Kohn, nice presentation, arigato. Um, from Ms. Rowena uh, M, uh, F. Agargo, thank you for that wonderful talk. It's my first time to know of the cross-cultural art made by the Japanese and Ngrense artists capturing an important part of Philippine history, indeed. Right, so another question or, yeah, uh, from an anonymous attendee, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Uh, Hirano-san, I found the exchange of art for children between uh, Tashima-san and Filipino artists, the Balangon picture book, very provocative and poignant, uh, poignant, especially given our current situation here in the Philippines. Did Tashima San publish a children's book uh, from his time in Negros? And will there be a publication output from your research? Thank you. Thank you for all these wonderful questions. And this, for the first question, Mr. Tashima hasn't published um, any picture books from his experience of um, Negros. And yeah, and I don't know the reason why, but. Um, I know he got sick after he came back from Negros. So he took a few months off. So maybe that was the time for him to reflect back. And I know he made one painting after he came back from Negros. And that's, yeah, also kept with him until today. Mm -hmm. And for the publication output, yes, um, I would like to publish it one day. And I'm also interested in making an exhibition if I can find the artworks that were created for Negros campaign or around this, you know, cultural movement, solidarity movement. But what's a bit difficult is um, because it's more about this advocacy of human rights and the artists are working with NGOs and their NGOs interest is not necessary to preserve art and cultural expressions. So the way the the works were treated was a bit different from you know the way we are used to working in museums or working in the art field. So there is not much left record of where the artworks went after the fundraising events or after fundraising exhibitions. So yeah, that's still something that I am trying to you know find out. But yeah, I don't know if I can manage to do it. It's also because of the time that has passed since the late 80s. Um, it's in the past few years, people passed away. These core yeah. members of Negros campaign have passed away. So it's get, becoming more difficult to access the memories. When there is no written materials, it's the people's memories. I always you know, try to um, not access, but you know, try to touch, but I think it's also becoming a little bit difficult for research. So I will have to find a different way to explore that. All right, thank you so much, uh, Mayumi-san. Definitely, uh, we look forward to your publication and perhaps even the exhibition, although we know that it's very difficult. Again, we have to look at uh, a lot of logistical um, mm. concerns. Um, but um, definitely something for us to think about. Maybe people in the audience can also uh, think about a future project no? if we can collaborate on. So there's a question asked in Japanese. Um, a question or a comment, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, mm -hmm. So it was very challenging to document all these processes. And I sometimes feel like I'm also failing to document some processes 
because you know sometimes my recorder was not working you know so i i only realized this kind of um technical issues only after the interview finishes right so then i have to run to a quiet place and i just write down what's in my mind so it's always this um yeah i'm always nervous about recording and keeping the record and archives and also i am very aware and conscious of the fact that i'm not the owner of these memories and materials so i'm i mean i'm borrowing these materials to create my presentation but i don't necessarily own it and i don't present it as my work so yeah uh, that's something that i always um keep it in mind when i put them out yeah, I think definitely uh, for all of us, especially those who are students um, in the Zoom room or uh, researchers, we have to understand that, yes, we are mediating these uh, processes. Yes, we are documenting them. But again, ownership, right? We don't own their words. We don't um, uh, take uh, what they call this credit for the works that they've done or the experiences that they've faced themselves. No? Again, um, this is a responsibility that researchers have right uh, with regards to archiving important events in the past right especially um here in tumultuous uh, in a tumultuous period in the philippines i the director of jfm uh, mr ben suzuki is raising his hand uh, suzuki san do you have a question Uh, Suzuki-san, your uh, mic is on mute. Okay, um, uh, Suzuki-san. All right, so perhaps um, Suzuki-san just has to uh, adjust, right, um, his mic. But I will ask another question from our audience. As someone from Negros Occidental, what urged you to choose the location and the indigenous artists for the study? Are the art pieces that are relevant to the Negros famine displayed or perhaps uh, uh, documented or kept anywhere or elsewhere? Thank you for this question. The motivation for me to visit Tarandig community in 2013 was um, Around that time, I was interested in researching about exhibition and festival making already in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And I was interested in how multiple people work together. And I learned about Tarandic community for their um, soil painting workshop. So they use soils to paint and they paint together. And it's a community of artists instead of um, individualizing their artistic practice. So that's why I really wanted to visit Tarandi. But of course, I knew it's a you know, indigenous community and I shouldn't be approaching it so roughly. But thankfully, there was a Facebook page of Tarandi um, so Painters Facebook page. So I sent a message and I got the reply and I had a meeting with the person who replied to me in Quezon City and we discussed and she told me there is a day when the gate is open to the guests. So yeah, I was, I think the timing wise, I was also very lucky. It was right before the festival. So yeah, I was able to go in there. Yeah, so that's the reason why I wanted to visit Tarandik community. And for the next question of art pieces relevant to the Negros family. Um, from, from the artworks that relates to my research, um, I, I know in the past they made exhibitions. And they made exhibitions with Mr. Tashima, of course, but from like bits of records, and it's also very personal writings. So it's not, doesn't give me the whole picture, but I know some works were actually um, carried on the, on the airplane like in the luggage from Negros to Japan to be included in the exhibition. But uh, at the moment, I don't have any list of artworks or any names of the artists who participated in this 
exhibitions in Japan from Bakorod or Nebulos. So it's been difficult to locate where these works are now and also to locate where the documentation of these exhibitions are. Right, that seems like another difficult undertaking, right? Inventory, making right. a list of all of the works that mm. were exhibited, even just tracking down all of the media reports about it, no? um, especially right. when we're trying to measure the impact of the Negros campaign in Japan. You mentioned that there were, it was a traveling exhibition, even in shopping malls, so mm -hmm. that they can really capture public attention, right? And right. again, documentation during that time uh, must be very difficult to track down. Mm -hmm. Another aspect of your research, perhaps. Yeah, exactly. Maybe. And I don't know if the audience here is a younger generation, but during that time, it's not even snapshots. They use slides. So it's even harder to find. No, and I think they didn't take as many documentations as we do now, like digital. It doesn't cost us anything. So we just randomly take photographs and multiple people are looking and photographing the same subject. But during that time, the situation was different. They were using the film. So, you know, exactly. it's not, yeah, exactly. And they are not necessarily digitized. And I don't come across with many images, not many images online. So yeah, that the technology really also affects the form of documentations. Right. It also shows the shift, right, of the practice of research, because now we have to digitize all of the documents and all of the photographs that we encounter or gather. So there's that kind of urgency that we have to digitize them in order in order to preserve the memory of these uh, particular events. I'm going to ask another question. Uh, Mayumi san from the q a um thank you for the great and insightful presentation this is from an anonymous attendee uh, hirano san this might overlap with the initial questions asked but i would just like to ask uh, were there any challenges that you encountered while working on your research you mentioned something about gathering materials and that you just showed us a glimpse of what you unpacked what would you say is your most remarkable experience in doing so mm. Thank you. The challenges, I have so many to share, but I think the most, um, yeah, there are many, but one challenge is uh, when I meet a person for the first time, because the questions I'll be asking can be also a bit personal, right? And just meeting a person for the first time, of course, makes me a bit nervous. So it's, I can't get everything um answered during one interview especially the first one so i always have to find a way to oh, wow. reconnect or stay connected with the person who i contact so if there is a hole that i see that i can maybe go back to the person and kindly ask for their memories about it so it's also the relationship building and I think that's uh, the connects to the next question, the process of unpacking and the remarkable experience in that is um, I borrow other people's photographs. And when I interview other person, other people, I showed these photographs and it sparks other people's memories. So it, this, um, so sometimes they said, oh, I had totally forgot about this exhibition or this event. But now you are bringing this image. I feel, wow, it really happened. You know, so I think that kind of response and yeah, like being there when memory is discovered, that excites me a lot. So it's a lot about uh, me listening to people's stories. And that's also connects me to another challenge of the language, especially when I'm interviewing, um, people in Bakorod, you know, there is a big language barrier. So I can only speak English and my Filipino or Irongo is, you know, nothing. So that uh, language barrier, I always face somehow. Yeah. You sometimes ask a friend or uh, a fellow artist to help you when it comes yeah. to interviews in Bakorod? Mm, I do, I do. 
And when it's like, when I set up as a formal interview, it gets stiff. So mm -hmm. it's better if I can go out for dinner or, you know, so like spend maybe a few hours together and then the uh, atmosphere gets a bit loosened up. And that's when I think the language barrier is a little bit um, less burdened. So, yeah. Right, so those are the behind the scenes um, <laughs> experiences about research that perhaps we don't talk about, that sometimes we think they're all about formal interviews, of course, because we want to be serious about documenting their experiences. But a lot of interesting insights are also gathered with these casual get togethers because people feel freer, right, um, in sharing um, all of their uh, thoughts, their experiences. And mm. it's also helpful for the interviewer as well to yeah. sort of break the ice, right? Yes. <laughs> all right. Um, so I have another question, actually. Um, you quoted uh, Raul D. Agner in your presentation, which I will quote again for our audience. Non Visayan guest artists came from Baguio and even as far as Japan. But then again, the guests tended to overshadow the locals. And I think this resonates with so many people, right? This, uh, this is often an issue with large scale um, international projects mounted in specific localities, right? Involving different communities like biennales and art festivals. So, what are some ways in which we can perhaps address with honesty and empathy? Um, imbalances, right? Asymmetrical relations when it comes to cultural exchange, because this is also an advocacy of yours, right? And you're wondering and you're trying to um, sort of dismantle this notion of collaboration. Mm. Yeah. Yes. No, no, yeah. No. Collaboration is a very tricky word because it sounds very smooth and friendly. And I think it makes us somehow a bit less critical. But when you think of it, like, Whose idea are we really trying to realize? And many times I think there is one side or one person who is initiating the idea. And the story is almost halfway planned and the rest is to be fulfilled through collaborations. And I feel that sometimes a bit problematic, especially the context, social, economic, and political context of this collaborators are different. So it's a very challenging, but I think collaboration is something that we have to spend lots of time developing. And maybe after yeah. several years, we can call it as collaboration, but not in the beginning. That's how I feel. Because it's true, yeah. no, someone has to initiate, and I don't think that's wrong. But it's just the question of how much time can we spend together? I think that's also very important when we think about the success of collaboration. Exactly, right? It's not just immersing yourself in a particular space or a particular community. It's not just about dialogue, but it has to be sustained for a long period of time, right? Mm. We can't just speed up collaboration, even though it's very tempting nowadays um, because there are a lot of deadlines when it comes to yeah. art festivals. Right. Right. So, Again, very um, practical uh, practical advice, right, mm -hmm. uh, from Mayumi-san. Thank you, spoken as someone who is truly an art manager and curator <laughs> and who also and, works with a lot of people behind the scenes. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's also the sense of responsibility for each other. Exactly. Yeah, so it's not that uh, I'm doing this work for you, but, you know, I'm doing this work for you because of me, you know, kind of thing. So mm -hmm. I think it always has to come back to make sure or to be very critical of one's own standing point. So we cannot be neutral mm -hmm. in collaboration. We have to know where we stand and where we come from and where we are going together. And I think that's something we have to figure out together in the process. It's not easy, no? <laughs> it's not easy and it involves honesty, right? It involves um, setting aside our egos, perhaps, and trying to understand each other, and also acknowledging that capacities amongst people are not necessarily balanced. I mean, right. obviously, in real life, right, with the real life on the ground projects, um, relationships and dynamics may be quite asymmetrical, but we try to mitigate it as much as we can. Mm. So I'm also going to, actually, there's another uh, Japanese question. Mm. Um, Mayumi-san, are you able so to see? It's, uh, yeah, when 
Asia come to the Philippines. So my stay here is on and off. <laughs> so the first time I did extensive research was in 2013. I have, I'm actually married to a Filipino. So that's my really a contact point with the Philippines. But after the one year of um, yeah, doing research here, I lived in Japan for a few years. And I went, yeah, I was traveling for several years. And I, we decided to settle in the Philippines in 2019. So yeah, I, I've been going back and forth between Philippines and Japan. Right, glad to have you here. We have a comment <laughs> from Suzuki-san, the director, the director of JFM. Just a brief comment, Negra's campaign was very important um, of, uh, for the foundation of uh, the NGO movement in Japan. Actually, you mentioned that during your research, right? Um, it was a collective and different um, organizations and cultural activists in Japan, right? Many Japanese people related to this campaign um, led the movement of civil society in Japan after this campaign in particular, the Negros campaign, that's how much impact it had. No? In this sense, Japanese liberal people, not only artists, learn a lot from Filipino people who work together for the campaign to nurture the civil society in Japan after 1990s. Thank you so much for that, Suzuki-san. I really, uh, we really appreciate that because you provided this balance, right? That we can learn from each other, not just Japanese artists coming here, but also <laughs> Filipino artists are able to influence, right? Um, minds and capture attention and promote awareness in Japan as well. Mm -hmm. So that's a great um, result of the cultural exchange. No? Um, hi, <laughs> and uh, Suzuki-san also has another uh, uh, message of, uh, for uh, Mayumi-san. Yeah. Ah. Oh. So actually, he's coming from Davao, ne? Uh -huh. Ah. <laughs> you know, I think to be really frank, I think Mr. Suzuki is a key person in my research also. Because I think, yeah, he's seen the scene at that time. And, you know, it's um, this information folder. And yeah, I've, I had the chance to interview him also for a um, project with Green Papaya. And that's when I learned that he saw this poster of black artists in Tokyo. So it's amazing to imagine people already moving around, you know, carrying this information um, yeah. when the airfare is not cheap and it's not that easy to travel. I mean, today it's again, really difficult to travel around, but yeah. I find it so fascinating that you were all compelled by this particular illustration right mm -hmm. for the negros campaign by tashima san in different ways and in different contexts and places mm -hmm. and you were trying to trace all of these connections together and it finally just unfolded as your research um, um evolved mm -hmm. so that one was an interesting uh uh that was interesting to hear from you as well um and as uh i'd also like to ask no no that your research, it unfolds with anecdotes, encounters with different Filipinos and Japanese people. Um, but aside from, a, um, from events that are more or less public knowledge, no, you, all, uh, you also often discuss unspoken narratives and casual conversations, particularly when you first shared your anecdotes in the first part of your presentation. And then you asked these questions, you related your specific context to these questions. How does an, an outsider rather enter a community or how does a community accept an outsider? And you problematize these binary notions, right? Of inside, outside, host, guest, and ideas of collaboration and fair exchange. And I feel like you're kind of grappling with this idea of if you are a guest, right? Even though you've been living here for so long, um, we consider you already, you know, part of the Philippines, of course, and part of the community of artists and curators here in the Philippines. But as someone who's worked with countless people behind the scenes, sure. right? How important is your idea of responsibility in Philippines Japan collaboration, particularly in your work? So are there other projects of yours perhaps that also that you uh, have done that respond to your um to your uh sort of 
exploring or navigating these notions of accountability, self-reflexivity, mm. and responsibility, responsibility mm. rather. Mm. Yeah, thank you for that question. Yes, um, I'm always learning so much from my friends in the Philippines. You know, just now Mr. Suzuki mentioned Negro's campaign mm -hmm. learned so much from their interaction with Filipino people. And that's when mm -hmm. you know, Japanese realized their tax money, taxpayers' money is going to the corrupt government. You know, so it's mm -hmm. not like, it feels like the problem in Negros is someone else's mm -hmm. problem. But through these exchanges and careful conversations, ongoing friendships, we learn our responsibility for the problem that others are facing. So, you know, there should be a way, something that we can work on. You know? So that's how I feel living here, talking to my friends from the Philippines from here, you know, telling me sometimes very difficult questions also. And I think that's what um, also pushes me to do research because by looking at other examples, that gives me a different perspective to think about what I can do. So okay. it's not just about the content of the research, but during the, you know, like small things in everyday life, it also helps me to think um, how I should be taking responsibility or how, you know, I don't know, sometimes I think people can be arrogant and I can also be arrogant. And I feel, you know, I was, because of this presentation, I was looking at photographs I took in 2013. And I can feel, mm -hmm. you know, this, um, my attitude of not really trying to understand, you know, I still had this um, glasses that I wore and that through the lens I was looking at, or I was judging different things. So I think my process of research is also try, how can I take off my, you know, glasses that I've been wearing from the time when I was living in Japan. So actually going, you know, yeah, that's um, always a struggle for me. And in terms of, so I don't know the specific projects to face this because I think all the projects that I work with or, you know, initiate, I try to make it a long time project. So not just right. one time, but so that the conversation can continue. Yeah, so I think that's something I'm always um, trying to achieve or trying to secure a space for long time engagement. But that's of course difficult because I'm involving others and you know, everyone has their own life and it, things change. So I try to keep the project as open as possible not necessarily trying to come rush to make a final form, but I approach it as a process. All right, and I think that's a healthy way to do it, right? Um, a more uh, organic and natural approach, rather than just trying to find easy answers or solutions to um, all of these um, historical research that you've been doing. And I like that it's a life work for you, that this is something, um, of course, your advocacy for invisible work in uh, the field of culture, no? arts and culture is something that you've been doing ever since, right? Um, even when you were starting out in curation. Um, um, and it, it it's really infused with all of the projects and all of the research that you've been doing and continue to do, right? So we just have, I think, uh, two questions um, before we wrap up. So Jose Gamboa asks, I think this is a general question, actually. How do you suggest artists deepen their art practice? Um, is it more important for artists to be uh, socially relevant or to develop their craft? So <laughs> it's quite a general <laughs> one. <laughs> Thank you. I am not an artist. So I think this question I have to let you decide, probably. But I think, you know, um, it's not just artists, but we as a person live in a context. You know? We don't live in a white cube or in a vacuum detached from the surroundings like social context. So I think um, the importance is not to cut these you know, um, elements that's composing our life and be open to it and recognize through our practice. So I think that's, um, 
maybe not an advice for this question, but that's how I try to um, create my own research or shape my research or my projects. Yeah, so be aware of what's happening around me. Right, right. And I think there's another question from uh, Joshua Beramo. No? So, uh, konnichiwa. No, I heard that Negros Occidental in our country happened long time ago. How do we help people um, that were homeless? I think um, Joshua is trying to ask, like, how can we help perhaps with um, um, per, uh, with the Negros campaign, like the further plight of, uh, uh, the plight rather of um, the workers in Negros? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I think there are many different ways to support. You know, like I think first is maybe raise awareness you know, of mm -hmm. um, people around us also. And I think that's the first step we can take. And of course, you know, charity, like money is of course needed, but that's also a very temporal solution to it. So I think the challenge or responsibility we have for you know, hunger crisis or political oppressions or social inequality is a long-term engagement again. And yeah, so it's not just about this mindset of charity we give to the person who is in need, but instead we need to think how can we you know, survive together? So it's, um, and I think Negro's campaign started or they transformed their activity. First was um, fundraising activity because it was a very urgent issue of hunger crisis. So people had to eat. So they had to raise money and bring food. But soon mm -hmm. after this fundraising event, they realized um, there has to be an education for the farmers. This is not just coming from Japan. No? It's coming from the Filipino um, people's um, opinions and advice. But they said, um, that we are given fish at the moment through charity, but what we need is a net to catch the fish. So that's when Negro's campaign shifted to fair trading and farmers' education. So they can you know, grow their own vegetables and Negro's campaign helps to export it to Japan. So it becomes um, you know, people to people trading so I think it also took a um, lot of creative shift in the way we think about um, charity. And that's also a um, word that we often hear in Japan. You know, we have this big campaign posters and calling for donations. And I think that's the easiest way, but it might probably not help um, solving the problem in a longer term because money always, we know where it, end up going. So I think we, the circulation of money and resources is something that I think we need to also change. But yeah, first is I think to be aware of the issue and look for um, how we are involved in this issue that feels far away. And from there, I think we can take an action. Right. And also, I think we also have to be um, aware that um, people different, uh, different people rather have different competencies, have different capabilities, right? Um, um, with regards to um, sensitive issues, no? it has to be a collaborative effort among different experts and different um, people, not just artists, of course, right? We have to um, expand the parameters, right? And go beyond our own discipline. And also um, look at other uh, experts in other disciplines, right? No? Especially when it comes to community work, comes with uh, um, workers' rights, et cetera, et cetera. No? So thank you for that, uh, Mayumi-san. No? Uh, we appreciate that you mentioned that it's not just about charity, no? that, uh, that this involves lengthy, long processes no? of truly understanding a particular situation and truly understanding um, the plight of um, the workers, not just in Negros, no, but um, mm. all across the Philippines, for that matter. We um, we don't have much time, actually. No, it's already three fifty nine. Um, thank you so much, everyone, no, for your patience. Uh, um, that ends our Q and A session. Thank you so much, uh, 
Um, Mayumi Sat, no? um, thank you for answering all of um, our questions for your presentation. Uh, and thank you to our audience as well for your questions. We deeply appreciate your uh, engagement. I'm sorry again, uh, no, my our apologies for the tech issues uh, a while ago. That's why we're, we're kind of running out of time, right? But I just, uh, I would just like to provide a, a bit of a synthesis. No? So Mayumi San's research unfolds again with anecdotes and uh, encounters no? involving different Filipinos and Japanese people. But aside from just formal interviews, right? She also surfaced what are perhaps unspoken narratives as well as tensions and friendships in Philippine-Japan uh, relations throughout history, right? So Mayumi uh, San does not simply document a particular time no, in, 19, in the 1980s and in, and in the 1990s, no, but she related them to stories during the Japanese occupation, chance encounters in a jeepney during the pandemic, stories and moments that perhaps may make us ponder on the future of Philippines-Japan cultural exchange, right? What was particularly uh, compelling about Mayumi San's presentation is that she interrogated slippery notions of collaboration, the idea of the collaborator, right? As I mentioned earlier, their evolving connotations over the years, and also questions about international exchange, fair exchange, right? Mutual exchange, collaboration, and so on. Um, um, she unpacked these words, right, these concepts, they're almost like buzzwords in a way, in ways that make us think about the actual practice of collaboration on the ground, um, to confront hierarchical relations in art and complex dynamics and relationships within uh, these complicated, right, art ecosystems. Um, of course, with all of these large-scale um, endeavors, right, um, we emphasize solidarity as a primary goal, but like with any other project, there are also contentions. I think most of the cultural workers um, in this audience, in this virtual room, can attest to how projects are never completely smooth, never perfect, right? However, we can also acknowledge that ultimately the objectives of many people involved in cultural exchange is to hopefully improve lives, promote awareness outside our own spaces, to create meaningful, um, creative, collaborative um, efforts and conversations between not just artists and curators and cultural workers, but also members of a particular community or non-artists. So um, Mayumi san also highlighted the complex web of interactions, right, between artists, communities, so many organizations, even the misfits, right? Um, you noted down everyday, seemingly mundane, right, interactions. And Mayumi san's approach in embracing honest conversations in her research practice huh, makes us uh, realize that aside from just attempting to build networks, no, we must also create effective cultures of care and empathy, right? responsibility, no, self reflexivity. Right, we all have to think about these things, no, right. And in Mayumi san's case, no, the artists that she has interviewed have always situated their work in their social polit uh, political advocacies and social political events of the period, right? Like martial, uh, martial law, the Negros famine, and with all of these testimonies, with all of these documents um, that Mayumi San has gathered during this time period, as I mentioned earlier, this would be very helpful to fight against this information, especially today, mm -hmm. right? And perhaps another thing that perhaps resonates with so many people is, again, you value um, self-reflexivity, you value accountability, you value invisible work, right? Um, you value highlighting that there are multiple people involved in projects, right? Again, cultivating this culture of care in the arts field. I mean, we all know that we work very hard and oftentimes um, it's very difficult to just realize these projects and, you know, it's not a lucrative endeavor, obviously, but um, Again, we're very thankful that you focus on what is going on behind the scenes, right? A lot of it is rendered invisible, um, unfortunately, no? or at least made to fade in the background because we are so hyper-focused on the optics of a successful project. No? But also, again, plans, advocacy, strategies are created during casual behind-the-scenes interactions as you discussed during the Q&A session, right? And all these... Um, Interesting lines in art practice and research are quite blurred nowadays, right? 
And uh, again, we emphasize cross-border solidarity. It involves different people, right? We go beyond the sort of hierarchical nation-to-nation -nation approach, right? We involve different communities, particularly with your research with the Talanting community, right? Finally, it was interesting to learn all about the motivations and happy coincidences that brought all of these people together. So highlights are, of course, the Zotashima's powerful Negros campaign poster received in 1986 by Mr. Norberto Roldan, compelled Mr. Ben Suzuki to visit Bacolod. Meanwhile, you also had your own memories, Mayumi-san, of looking at this particular um, illustration, but also your own memories of Seizo Tajima's work no, growing up. And um, there's also Tatsuo Inagaki's ongoing art practice in the Visayan region, so many others. And while um, we're very thankful that you foregrounded Seizo Tajima's um, exhibition, an illustration, you also um, uh, emphasize the important work of Filipinos who were in solidarity um, for, uh, with the Negros campaign, right? So Ms. Desa Quesadafal, Mr. Nunelucio Alvarado, and so many other people. So it's very important that we also include Filipino voices. Again, thank you so much, Mayumi-san, for your presentation. We deeply appreciate it. That ends our webinar for this afternoon. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. Um, perhaps our audience can remember all of these important points. No? When you do your own research, when you get involved in cultural work and cultural exchange yourself. No? And of course, a while ago, we also heard about all of these grants. And we encourage you to apply as well. So let's reflect upon our roles no? in art productions, in art festivals. Be responsible as artists, as curators, as guests, and as audiences when we are invited to a variety of spaces. right? So on behalf of the Japan Foundation Manila, I would like to thank you all for spending your Saturday afternoon with us, most especially to our guest speaker, Ms. Mayumi Hirano, our oh. frequent collaborator. <laughs> thank you so much um, for all of the hard work that you do. Um, thank you for sharing your knowledge and your experiences. We've learned a lot from you today. Um, lastly, before we end this webinar, we would like to request our viewers to help us improve our programs and services by filling out the questionnaire that we prepared. Uh, we truly value your feedback. And with that, thank you once again for joining us. Thank you so much, Mayumi-san. Thank you to the audience. Arigato gozaimashita. Maraming salamat sa inyong lahat. Until the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you.